So it's wonderful to have you all on board. Uh, um, very special greetings to all of you in all the different parts of the world. Uh, this is amazing how many people are following us uh, from every corner of the world. So a uh, very special welcome to all of you. My name is Marcela Villarreal. I'm the Director of uh, Partnerships and UN Collaboration Division here at FAO. Uh, just to let you know that the session is being recorded and I encourage all of you to write in the chat who you are. I mean, we, we've been seeing many of you writing uh, who you are, where you're connecting from. And also, uh, please just be reminding there is a Q&A box for questions you would like to ask, specific questions. And if you ask a question, please also uh, put in who the question is directed to. So very warm welcome to this uh, very important event uh, for us to launch the Memorandum of Understanding between FAO and Wageningen University and, um, un uh, and research. So our MOU is about science and innovation for more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems. So um, we have several objectives for the day of today. Of course, we want to celebrate the long-standing partnership uh, between FAO and Wageningen, uh, raising awareness on the recently signed uh, Memorandum of Understanding and also new and strengthened areas of cooperation. We'd also like uh, to highlight both institutions' visions and missions and their joint efforts to support the achievement, of course, of all the SDGs. We want also to provide a platform to discuss selected technical areas of joint work uh, between the two institutions in line with uh, the eight areas of cooperation of uh, the uh, Memorandum of Understanding. So we're gonna have three, of, three segments today uh, for this event. We start with a high level session with our keynote speakers. Then we go into two uh, thematic technical sessions with technical experts from both institutions, and then we'll come back for a closing session. So um, the event is going to be officially opened in a moment uh, by uh, the FAO Director General, but first uh, let us see a short video highlighting uh, the partnership. Wonderful video. So it's now my pleasure to give the floor to FAO's Director General, uh, Dr. Chu Dongyu. Please, Director General, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. And uh, dear Professor Luis Fresco and Ambassador uh, Marcelo Pokeboom. I, I hope I pronounce your Dutch name still correct. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, today's event is celebrated the law and the fruitful partnership between FL and the Wageningen University and the research. For the over 50 years, FL and the Wageningen University have been working together with a shared objective to improve lives while they're protecting natural resources through the innovative and sustainable approaches. This dynamic collaboration offers a unique opportunities to leverage our collective comparable uh, 
advantages and uh, accelerate our joint efforts towards the uh, achievement of SDGs. Collaboration and the uh, partnership are essential to find innovative solutions for growing and complex challenges in our agrophysics. Effort strategy framework 2022 to 31 seeks to support the 2030 agenda through the transformation to more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agrophysics for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life for all leaving no one behind. To achieve this transformation, we need a holistic approach to minimize the trade-offs using data, science, and innovation, and enabling policy. We are currently developing the first ever semantic strategy on science and innovation. The strategy will prioritize science, innovative solutions, and increase the process in the implementation of our strategy framework in full alignment with the 2030 agenda. FL's flagship uh, initiative further supported the key role of science and innovation for the transformation of ecosystems. This included FL hand in hand initiative, 1000 digital value initiative, and that one country, one priority product initiative. As a host of the Food System, UN Food System uh, uh, Summit, uh, follow up action, uh, uh, and we are hosting a coordination hub for that, for the UN First Summit uh, follow up action. FAO has a key role in the UN First System Summit follow up, and by providing support to countries in the implementation of their national pathways and the priorities. FAO hosts the international standard setting bodies, such as the Cortex Alimentaries, for many years. Eh? which continue to be the global platform for food safety and the quality standard that protect the consumers and facilitate good practice in food trade. And the International Plant Protection Convention, which is a, a sole global standard setting body for plant health. It will also provide a range of global public goods, such as the global information and early warning system on food and agriculture which is a world leading resource of information on global food production, consumption, trade. Another important uh, uh, global public good are the course offered by the FLE Learning Academy. And also I can mention also our international platform for digital agriculture and food uh, and together the I ICT application for agro-food systems and the rural development. Our commitment is rooted in transformative partnership to generate the game changer solutions needed to address the complex set of the agro-system challenges and achieving the SDGs. If a working partnership focus on the developing sharing knowledge and expertise, harnessing the latest technology and the innovation for agro-food systems based on the robust science and evidence. This collaboration enhances the impact of our joint activities that contribute to delivery, effective, efficient, science-based, high-quality programs. The renewed Memorandum of Understanding signed in December 2021 established eight technical areas of collaboration and provide a solid forward-looking framework uh, to further strengthen the and accelerate our collaboration and lead the concrete results. The renewed agreement set out a new joint vision for bridging the science and policy interface and to provide a platform to, to connect research staff to the policy makers. What I expect, you know, most FO is an intergovernment. UN specialized agency. And also it should be bringing all the key stakeholders work together, namely government, uh, international cooperation, uh, international organizations, uh, private sectors, uh, academic uh, institutions, and the civil society NGOs. Eh? I think the Wahaning also, it's uh, uh, personally, I saw that also it's a very open uh, uh, international uh, rapid, uh, high reputed uh, university and the research center, and also uh, uh, open to the, all the possibility of innovation. That's something is unique for FAO and for the world, especially for Europe. 
I think at this time we need more science empowerment, empowerment uh, in Europe, in the countryside to help the transform agri-food system in Europe by the science and the innovation. And you name it, all the products, green development or green deal you call, or organic food. First, you respect the international standard and the consistent traceability and also quality control. Any consumers appreciate the consistent quality. You pay for today $1, and next day you pay $1 for another different quality. That's something you're losing the competitiveness. I know the happening and at large of a, uh, and the uh, Dutch agricultural uh, sectors. You will benefit from linkage between research and extension and the, and the uh, management or business management. That's your advantage. That's what the agent needed for the rest of the world, not only for the developing country, for other developed nations. You have to you know, share this experience. And second, also, I just talked with the uh, honorable professor, Luis Fresco. You need the agent you need to open the training, the people who are working the uh, uh, international business and the environmentalists and the diplomatic persons and the financial people to understand what the real means of agri-food systems in Europe. And you can build up the real alias to support the agri-food system transformation in Europe because the farmers and the consumers need you to, to, to uh, make use of your experience and knowledge for the uh, people in Europe. So Wahaning not only work for the agriculture and the, and, the, and, the, and the farmers, you should open to the other sectors which you actually need. During the past three years, I have a strong you know, impression. And because you, not only they say the science and the policy interface, I think agriculture interface with the other sectors in Europe. Dear colleagues, science and innovation are key transform the world agricultural system to, to nourish people, nature, and the planet, and advance the equitable livelihood and the build a resilience ecosystem. Let us continue to work in an efficient, effective, and a coherent manner towards the world free from hunger and also of the health food for health life. That's the value of the innovation science. This is the extra contribution from Wahading University Research. We, let's work together more and better. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Director General. And uh, as you mentioned, I think uh, this partnership and collaboration between our two institutions is uh, actually older than many, should I say most of the people participating here today. Um, and thank you for um, uh, bringing up the importance of transformative partnerships for our new strategic framework. And uh, we believe that this partnership in particular has massive transformative power for agri-food system transformation, given the very concrete solutions it is uh, proposing in terms of the science policy interface. So thank you very much uh, for your words, uh, Director General. Now, it is my great pleasure to um, ask uh, to take the floor uh, to the president of Wageningen University and Research Executive Board. And um, um, uh, I would like to um, invite our uh, dear uh, Luis Fresco, a uh, dear friend uh, who has been a longtime friend of FAO, uh, to uh, take the floor now. Luis, you have the floor. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you, first of all, Director General, for your words and for the friendship between Wageningen and, and um, uh, FAO. I think, indeed, we go back a long way, and it's also very appropriate that we renew and review the way we work together. And may I add that this is also a special moment for me. In this last position as president of Wageningen University and Research, I have been shorter than in my last position at FAO. <laughs> so my years at FEO are as important as my wagoning in years. And so I feel a little bit as a person, I embody also this kind of partnership. 
Uh, and there is good reason for that, because what links the two is a true commitment to food security, to improving the lives and well-being of people, but also to a science-driven approach to it, this improvement. And I think it's the, the, the knowledge that makes us strong, and it's the sharing of knowledge, which is the most important thing we can do. And I hope very much that this um, framework agreement that we have today can also serve as an example or as an inspiration rather to other um, knowledge institutions that you will work with. Because it would be very nice to think of a network of institutions that together want to provide the science that is so badly needed. And indeed, you rightly point to the concerns that you have and that I share with you that science is not perhaps as sacred and as unequivocal as it has been perhaps 50 years ago when we started working together. That has a lot of causes which we cannot deal with today, but it is a fact that knowledge and science and scientists are not always seen as neutral and objective by society. And this is something we need to deal with. I'm saying this very much because I feel that if there is one sustainable resource that we share in society, it is knowledge. Knowledge is not a resource like oil. It doesn't get exhausted. It doesn't get polluted. It may get polluted, but not by knowledge itself, by other ideologies. But it's also something that actually improves when it's being used. Sharing knowledge means better knowledge. And I think it's a good time to say that now that so many um, misinformation moments occur in day-to-day -day life, and also now that there is so much confusion in the public, but also at policy levels. I think that we are facing a situation even before the current crisis in Ukraine where Perhaps policymakers, society, consumers are um, uh, swamped with pseudo knowledge, with half truth, with semi facts. And it is very difficult to hear in that enormous chorus of voices, opinions, and ideologies what is really true science based fact. What do we know? What don't we know? And I have to say immediately that also we, as uh, knowledge institutions, have perhaps been too slow in identifying where the, the uncertainty in some of the knowledge is. But I think the potential and the needs and the moral necessity and duty that we have to bring knowledge to the, um, the possibilities of to the reach of all is even more urgent today than it was 50 years ago or even 10 or 20 years ago. Having said that, it's clear that the crisis in Ukraine makes us enter a new age, a new geopolitical age, but also an age in which food and supplies to agriculture are again number one on the political table. Um, it's very regretful that that is because of a, a crisis that makes so many victims, but it's also important to make people realize that we live in a world of very interconnected food chains, of very interconnected supply chains, and that food and agriculture and the inputs that are necessary and the whole distribution system must be the number one priority of the heads of government and not just left to ministers of agriculture. So I fully concur with you, Director General, that this is also a matter of ministers of finance and ministers of trade and ministers of defense. Agriculture and food security are essential and the world can never be disentangled again. There is no autarky, not even continents can be on their own. Countries certainly cannot and should not want to be. Agriculture and food are like environment and health, truly multilateral issues. They're truly global and we have a global responsibility to get the best interconnected science that brings to bear what we know and also shows how, for example, health and agriculture, think corona, zoonotic diseases, are linked together. Now, having, having said that, it is true that we need a lot more work. There, we don't have all the answers. We have a lot of answers, and it's been always our aim at Wageningen to make sure that we share our knowledge and that we explore answers with whoever comes to study and whoever comes to work with us. I think the, the, the challenge we have is to get a new generation of young scientists and also of young executives, of young entrepreneurs who are science and innovation based and want to apply that to food security. 
Unfortunately, as you know, most young and gifted people will go to uh, sciences like computer science and not to agriculture. Agriculture in many countries is seen as rural areas and backwards. We should change that. There is a new narrative and I would like to also encourage ourselves in our collaboration here between FAO and uh, Wageningen to really think about that new narrative. How can we encourage young people to take up what I still believe after all these years that I've spent in the field is the most exciting subject you can work on. It is so important because it's peace meal, it's, it's part and piece of our future. There is no civilization, no peace, no well-being without food and agriculture. So what more do you want to work in? But what we need to show is that agriculture and food are not dry subjects, they're not hard working. The small is beautiful approach that I remember from, from not so many years past that you should try and you know, give small farmers a little bit of something so that they are still small farmers but can do their authentic thing. I think that is an idea of the past. What we need is to help entrepreneurial young farmers to become modern farmers, to become innovation driven farmers and get the best access to science, whether it's the public route or whether it's to the private sector. And that kind of collaboration needs to be articulated in every country. That is the true sense of entering in a dialogue. It's not just an interface between science and policy, as you rightly say, Director General. It's also very much the interface between science and the rest of society. We need to become societies, countries, and a world that is truly science-driven. Now, science-driven doesn't mean that science has all the answers. It doesn't mean that there's only truth in science. Of course, there are things that are not the realm of science, but it means I believe, if you say science-driven, that there is the profound desire to test hypotheses, to test solutions, and to speak about them and find the best possible solutions. And that is an ongoing process. It's not so that we will find all the answers at the same time. But to me, science is neutral, and at the same time, therefore, there are no taboo subjects. We should educate young people, our collaborators, but also indeed the ministers of finance and what have you in asking the right questions, because it's only by asking the right questions that we get the right answers. And those answers are extremely urgent. I don't need to say that to you because you all know it. But if there's something that I want to leave with you is that I have that sense of urgency. I think you all have it and we must move forward. We cannot now sort of disintegrate into a world where every country or every continent is again reinventing its own science or reinventing its own ideologies and applying things that are not science-based and not innovation-driven. And innovation can do so much for small farmers, for women farmers, for biodiversity, just by offering the monitoring tools, by offering quality control, by offering ideas about how to move forward, how to apply the best of knowledge, which may be the best genetics, the best artificial intelligence, the best systems to understand economics. And our first task is, to ask, is to really show the potential of science. So let's find in those eight areas that we have identified some of the flagships to show what can difference can science make and get young people enthusiastic. And yes, indeed, see understanding agriculture and food systems as a lifelong task. This is something that doesn't stop when you have a degree, that doesn't stop when you have your first post at FEO. No. I have learned throughout my life that every day is a day that comes with a question. Every collaboration should come with a question. And every day we should really try to answer those questions because we are privileged that we can sit here and have the chance to have a job, to have access to knowledge, to have access to a network and to friends. But so many people out there have not. And we have a duty, a moral duty, but also a scientific duty to get the best of knowledge to them. And I hope that this enormous task will be taken up by us, not just by FAO and Wageningen, but by all those who want to join this inspiring partnership. So thank you very much and good luck. I will be there throughout the symposium with you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, so very, very much uh, for your actually very inspiring words. And uh, of course, we remember you so very well from your years at FAO and indeed you are strongly missed uh, here at FAO, uh, we, we agree with you entirely that uh, knowledge is 
a sustainable resource and one of the most precious ones uh, actually. And I really like your take on that it's improved uh, when it is used. Uh, we do need a new narrative, I fully agree. And I do believe, as you say, that this partnership in particular will provide that, help provide that new narrative and definitely be an inspiration uh, for many more uh, to come. So thank you for, for your words. Now um, I have uh, the big pleasure uh, to give the floor to the permanent representative of the Kingdom of the ne Netherlands to the UN Organizations for Food and Agriculture, His Excellency Ambassador Marcel Boikebon. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, uh, Marcella. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, the children who are looking for passengers for Kumasi, take our hand and escort us to the right bus dancing for joy. They're happy. If they find a passenger, they get a banana or an orange from the driver. We embark and sit down. This is the moment two cultures could clash. A conflict could arise. That would be the case if the passenger is a newcomer and does not know Africa. Someone like that starts to look around, becomes restless and starts asking questions. When will the bus depart? When? answers the surprised driver, when my bus is full with people. I had to think of this passage in the shadow of the sun, a book by Polish journalist and author Richard Kapuczynski about his adventures in Africa, when earlier this week, all train traffic in the Netherlands came to a sudden standstill because of IT issues. Nothing worked anymore. There was no manual backup and alternatives could not be organized in time. Communication to the public was insufficient or unreliable. Unre and in the end, people had to look after themselves. There are many elements in these two tales that could serve as an entry point or metaphor for my story today. In the interest of time, I will just take three. Risk, trust, and inclusion. First, risk. Whereas the Ghanaians in Kapuczynski's story did not seem to be bothered by the risk of coming too late, or of getting to their destination at all, people in highly organized countries like my own have become very risk adverse, even risk intolerant. Citizens do not accept risk anymore and demand from their governments to eliminate risk altogether. Of course, this is an illusion, but politicians do often oblige, fearful as they are to be seen as indecisive. Scholars of public policy have come up with a name for this phenomenon the risk regulate effect. That is a tendency to counter every incident with generic regulate, regulation. When we zoom out to the global level, we see a different picture. In this year's global risk report of the World Economic Forum, the number one risk as perceived by its respondents is climate action failure. At this scale, apparently, the risk regulate effect does not apply as the global response to date is highly inadequate. See also this week's IPCC report. Ironically, many respondents also fear that late and rapid policy shifts that are becoming inevitable will leave businesses and societies with little time to adapt and could cause deep disruption. Risk is a fluid concept. Risk is about uncertainty and probability. And as my bus and train examples illustrate, risk perception differs in place and evolves over time. This is the domain of scientists and experts. They study, interpret, and explain. And next, it is up to policymakers to decide what to do. In today's highly volatile world, such science policy interfaces are of extreme added value. The risks topping the World Economic Forum's list provide a clear agenda for the science policy interface we celebrate today. The second concept I would like to highlight today is trust. Trust is the most important threat that holds our societies together. We trust the train will come and the bus will depart. We trust a jar with peanut butter contains peanuts, as its label suggests. We trust there will be a bed in hospital when a virus threatens our health. And we trust our governments to take care of the rest so we can carry on with our lives. Or don't we? In its annual trust barometer, the global communications firm Edelman measures the temperature in 28 countries across the globe. 
the ominous theme of this year's report is a cycle of distrust. People say institutions are failing to address existential challenges and are not doing well in their responses to the pandemic and climate change. There's a general lack of trust in leaders, but worst off are government leaders and media. There are two glimmers of hope in this report that are relevant for today. First, against this trend, scientists are still highly trusted, even gained a little bit. And second, trust in multilateral institutions rises, with WHO driving up this figure by showing leadership during a global health crisis. <clears throat> That's no reason for complacency though. As trust is hard to gain and easy to lose, this brings a big responsibility with it. Science and multilateral institutions have something to defend, but also to build upon. Indeed, exactly as we are doing here today. A third and obvious conclusion to draw from my public transport examples is, we should leave no one behind, the work ethic of the Ghanaian bus driver. For the UN, this is one of its core principles. The Sustainable Development Goals aim to do just that. Wageningen University and Research embraces this principle and the SDGs for that matter as well. Projected on a science policy interface, however, it is not immediately clear what leave, leaving no one behind means. Is this about access to education, an equal footing for all sources of information, a democratic application of knowledge? Should scientists be involved in policy formulation? I'm sure these questions will be addressed in this renewed partnership between Wurr and FAO. I just take this opportunity to table a few more challenges that need attention in this context. In the interest of time, I only briefly mention the inclusion of youth and women, the inequality in access to information and knowledge across regions, the inclusion of vulnerable and marginalized groups, and the value of indigenous knowledge. Ms. Fresco, Mr. Chu, Ms. Eluafi, Excellencies, addressing global risks by taking the necessary risks, building trust by trusting each other, and working on an inclusive world by being inclusive could as well be the solid pillars under your partnership. I congratulate FAO and VER with the renewal of this partnership and thank you for the honor to speak at this memorable event on this special day. Oh, and by the way, Mr. Kapuczynski's bus left after two hours and eventually <laughs> made it to Kumasi. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Ambassador. And uh, yes, Kapuczynski. Actually, Luis Fresco, I don't know, Luis, if you remember, you were the one, the first one who gave me a book on Kapuczynski. And I've been. Absolutely, absolutely. Ever. I was going to say, Kapuczynski is a, a very great example of a writer who has been really seriously looking at what is happening around. So I'm glad you remember that, Marcella, as well. I, I do. And absolutely. for everybody, by the way, not only read Kapuczynski, but read books in general. I fully agree, fully agree. And thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, we, we strongly believe that this partnership is going to address the issues that you're bringing up. Uh, partnerships are based on trust and will go a long way in making that uh, trust much, much deeper. And uh, as you say, we need a science uh, policy interface. And as Louise was saying, we need to bring in the civil society also. That will deepen the trust, but will also address the issue that you brought up, uh, Ambassador, inclusion. And altogether, that is going to reduce the risk. So thank you so very much uh, for that uh, intervention, Ambassador. It is now my pleasure uh, to give the floor to FAO's chief scientist, Ismahan Elwafi. Ismahan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marcella. And I have to say, it's really hard to speak after these three great speeches. But I, let me just really express my real pleasure to be with you today and with these great keynote speakers and celebrate FAO VER partnership. Let me also join our DG in thanking the president of VER Executive Board, Professor Luis Fresco, and the permanent representative to, of the Netherlands Ambassador Marcel Bukebu for being with us today. Thank you for the joint work with FAO and for your commitment to supporting science and innovation for more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agri-food system. I couldn't agree more with many of the things that were said today. 
One of them is that we need today more than ever science and innovation, is that we have to bring back more trust in science. It's good, Marcel, to hear that the survey shows that people trust science, but still I do think that we have an issue with, with lots of partisan taking part of science and financing science, which has weakened our, our strength. So we have to get it back. So science and innovation is at the heart of the 2030 development agenda. And it does contribute to all SDGs or the majority of the SDGs. Science and innovation are also serves as a foundation for our FAO strategic framework for the next decade. And it is it cuts across all dimensions of the strategic framework. And as our DG mentioned, we are currently working on developing the FAO first ever science and innovation strategy. And it's really, it's really overwhelming to see how much interest this is brings from different member states, but also from different organizations. This development of the strategy, the science and innovation strategy to support the strategic framework, it's being done through a very extensive, inclusive and transparent consultation, consultation process with our member states and within FAO. So we always say FAO, it's a very technical organization and a special UN agency for food and agriculture. And hence, everything we do has a science and innovation background to it. But could we push the bar? And I think this is the kind of partnership that really can help us get there. So the strategy covers all sectors and areas of agri-food system, including the crop, the livestock, forestry, fisheries, and aquaculture. It covers from natural resource management to production, consumption, but also food loss and waste. It does recognize the need for a diversity of innovation. And in that perspective, we are looking really at the broad definition of innovation to support the transformation of the agri-food system. And that includes technological innovation, such as digital innovation, but also social innovation, policy innovation, financial innovations, and institutional innovation. The strategy also underlined that the importance of the knowledge of small scale producers and indigenous people are very important as a source of innovation, but also a source of knowledge. And I think really we haven't been good enough at capturing the, the local knowledge and the indigenous knowledge. And what we said about the knowledge, it gets bigger as it is used. I think that indigenous knowledge and local knowledge has been restrained or has been shrinking because we have not been using it. It also gives particular attention to the need of low and middle income countries with a focus on small scale producers, on family farmers, indigenous people, women and youth, as well as micro, small and medium sized enterprises. I think really, if, if I have to go back right now, I have a different view, but when I was young, I went into genetics by chance. But really, if I have to redo it, I would do it. And this is really what we have to get the youth people to think, is that agriculture and food, it's a thing that we cannot give up, whatever happens. IT doesn't work, the buses doesn't work, we still need to eat, we still need to produce. So I hope really that science and technology and innovation can get those youth to get excited about it and come back and innovate and innovate using the new technology, but also using the old knowledge particularly. So the strategy has two enablers, transformative partnership and innovative funding and finance, which both of them will act as catalyzer for our goal achievement. Transformative partnership are essential to leverage technical expertise, promote knowledge sharing and sparkle innovation. Working jointly with our partners, we can avoid duplication. We can enhance complementarities and synergies so that hopefully we can deliver an impact at scale globally and have an impact at scale. I think the goal of our strategy is that members harness science and innovation to realize context specific and systemic solution for more efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable agriculture system so that we get to our better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life leaving no one behind. Ladies and gentlemen, we can only achieve this goal by working hand in hand with our partners, 
to fully leverage the potential of science and innovation to support the delivery to the FAO strategic framework and ultimately to the 2030 development agenda. This is why transformative partnerships such as the one we have established with Wageningen University and research are very crucial. These are the type of partnership which will catalyze the achievement of our goal. And this is the kind of, of network of universities and knowledge generator that we need to build up. And I fully agree with you, DG and Louise. This is an example that we have. Many more will come and that will attract attention. And hence, we get really that, that uh, environment of, of so many knowledge generators holding hand and working together. FAO is not a research institution, but we cooperate with the research institution, both national and regional, as well as universities from both the North and the South which are producing breakthrough scientific knowledge and innovation that are badly needed when we look at the least income countries and we look at the marginalized communities and people. This allows us to work as a neutral platform and broker for the science policy interface, supporting our members in accessing more innovation and evidence and science-based knowledge. Going forward, FAO must strengthen its position as a source of reliable scientific information and a neutral platform at the heart of important debate. Engaging on issues that are contentious and have presented communication challenges, it's therefore very imperative. And I think we could help really bring back the trust, the 100% trust in science, because from our position, we could really clarify what we know, what we don't know, and where we see wrongdoing or where we see wrong calculation and analysis. So allow me to give you a concrete example of our joint work with VER. We have commissioned an issue paper on gene editing technologies for agri-food system. It focuses on the potential benefits, but also the risks and the unintended consequences, as well as the barrier for adoption and diffusion, implication for small-scale producers, and the good regulatory, ethical, and policy issues. The proposed issue paper on gene editing is intended to be science and evidence-based and forward-looking, drawing on current information and the plurality of science methods and analytical scale. It is not about FAO taking for or against position. Rather, FAO has a role in providing robust evidence and convening the global community for constructive dialogue and exchange of knowledge. Based on the relevant scientific expertise, gender and geographic balance, we have assembled a very strong drafting team with the VER experts as the lead author. The recently signed MOU between FAO and VER comes at a very strategic time when we are on the path to endorsing the FAO science and innovation strategy and thinking about its implementation. I'm really positive that our partnership with VER will be strengthened to support the implementation of the new strategic science and innovation strategy and consequently of the FAO strategic framework and the 2030 agenda. So let's keep working together to support our members to really harness science and innovation to realize context specific and systemic solution for again, a more efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable agri-food system so that we get to really a better world and that we provide science to all. And that really that accessibility will allow the local communities to innovate and do better and produce more with less. Thank you very much and over to you, Marcel. Thank you so much, um, Ismahan, our chief scientist, um, and uh, fully agree with you. We need more than ever science and innovation, but uh, for that, we need to really push the bar and we need to be able to also bring in uh, the types of knowledges uh, that are there, like the small uh, holders, uh, indigenous peoples, women, youth, they all need to be uh, brought in into the knowledge uh, equation. So thank you very, very much. Uh, for uh, those uh, words. Now, um, I think we would need to go straight into the next uh, session. 
Uh, there will be no time now for questions and answers, but there are questions and answers already in, in the Q&A function. So I would like to ask also our panelists if uh, you would uh, like to take uh, a look at those questions and see if you can provide answers. So thank you for that. And let me now uh, just uh, close uh, this uh, first session and uh, move on to the second session. And for that, I'd like to invite Preet uh, Lider to take uh, the floor. So thanks very, very much uh, to all of our uh, panelists in this very, very interesting and stimulating session. Over to you, Preet. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Preet Lida. I am technical advisor to the FAO chief scientist, and I'm very pleased to moderate the first technical session on science, technology, and innovation for food security and climate action. So coming back to the objectives of this technical session, one is providing a platform for experts from FAO and Wageningen University to share firsthand experience on their joint activities and discuss how science, technology, and innovation is essential to overcoming the impacts of climate-related shocks in agri-food systems and promoting interaction with you, the audience, on science, technology, and innovation for food security and climate action, generating a two-way debate and collective reflection on the theme. Ladies and gentlemen, as was just reiterated during the high-level segment, harnessing science, technology, and innovation is key to meeting the aspiration of efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems, as well as for leveraging emerging opportunities for achieving the SDGs. We are joined by two panelists from the two organizations today. Mr. Ivo Demers, Program Lead for the Research Program on Food Security and Valuing Water at Wageningen University, and Mr. Eric Van Ingen, Digital Agriculture and Innovation Specialist in the FAO Office of Innovation and the FAO Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment. I would first like to invite Ivo Demers to deliver his statement. Over to you, Ivo. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you um, for having uh, having me in this session, uh, Preet and, uh, and Eric. Um, yes, food security and valuing water, that's a research program which uh, runs through the entire Wageningen University Research Organization, hence connecting uh, animal, plant, uh, economic, social, environmental uh, sciences. Um, so it's truly a multidisciplinary uh, uh, research program in which we use a food system approach um, to tackle SDG uh, 2 issues, which includes uh, climate change. Um, to say a bit more about that, we are focusing in the research program on East Africa and Southeast uh, Asia. So I will mention briefly uh, some examples related to, uh, to those areas. Um, one of the, the topics we, uh, we cover is, uh, is food and water. And then specifically, we look at uh, dealing uh, with saline environments on multiple scales. Um, and that is becoming uh, increasingly important uh, due to climate change. Think of a sea level rise, but there are also autonomous uh, and human induced uh, drivers behind that, like uh, soil subsidence. Uh, we're working together with uh, FAO on that, and that's the most important um, uh, to mention here in this session with uh, WESAC and uh, INSAS uh, working groups. Um, and in our research program, we not only look at uh, saline agriculture, but look at the entire kaleidoscope uh, of what we can do uh, with uh, increasing food from water. So we look at coastal uh, waters, but also look at the degraded lands, which are in the interface between land and, and water. And we look at saline environments uh, shorter and a bit further from the, uh, the coastal area. Um, our research focuses, for instance, on the combination of seaweed and, uh, and shrimp uh, and mangrove and, sh and shrimp. Um, in, um, which offers so much uh, increasing uh, uh, opportunities for coastal communities uh, to increase uh, their food security, but also uh, benefit from, uh, from the connection to the international market. So to really increase the value chains. Um, and that in our uh, research has a pivotal role. It's a food systems uh, approach. 
look at production, look at increasing uh, diets, inclusive and equitable value change, which go hand in hand with uh, sustainability and, and resilience. Um, and in that respect, not only the technical issues like in uh, how to deal with the uh, saline environments is important, uh, but also how we deal uh, with um, midstream developments. Uh, and it was already, already mentioned, um, farmers, um, but also the midstream development, the midstream companies behind it need to attract uh, young people, need to be talented uh, entrepreneurs to uh, really transform our food systems. So how do we do that, the midstream development, especially in areas where there's no so much as a formal sector? So especially in, in Kenya, in improving, um, bringing um, proteins to uh, Kibera, slum of Nairobi, we work together with uh, FAO uh, officers uh, in, in Kenya on how to reach out to the informal sector in the slum and using the informal networks and business development to bring a thousand kilos of fish every week uh, to Kibera and actually have it also consumed. Um, and in that, and the role of FAO and we're together was, was very nice to see in the sense that even before the project, there were, con there were already contacts. Uh, but also during the project, there was a lot of support and exchange of knowledge and making use of each other's networks. Um, and you could see it as a loop because after the project and uh, um, and the, the, the thousand kilos of fish were being constantly uh, shipped to uh, Kibera, we got the opportunity to present the results in a um, um, independent dialogues organized by FAO for the uh, Food Systems Summit. So there you can see we have multiple roles in this collaboration. It's about bringing out networks, bringing uh, knowledge to the table, connecting to informal uh, networks, but also connecting to formal networks. Um, one last uh, point I would like to make, uh, and that is about uh, farmers, big, uh, and as well noted also small scale uh, producers, private sector and governments um, need to address often highly dynamic situ situations. Often they occur in, uh, in deltas. Um, then they have to react to consumer preferences, markets, climates, um, in order not only to produce enough, but also safe foods for all uh, without compromising the environment. Uh, so in that respect, not only climate smart agriculture may be enough, but we need, really need the agriculture transformation. And exactly that is what is going on in Vietnam, but also is uh, going on in, in Bangladesh. And they see that a strong collaboration between FAO and WUR um, may speed up this also um, needed and cherished uh, agriculture transformation, cherished also by the Bangladesh um, government and by the international financing institutions may provide opportunities not only to uh, show uh, what the benefits of our co collaboration are, but also really to speed up the transition in an area, uh, in a specific Delta area in, in Bangladesh. Uh, and I know this is on the table already in the international um, conference on uh, Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100 in uh, May, <clears throat> May of, uh, of this year, 26 and 27. There's room reserved to, to discuss the agriculture transformation there. Uh, FAO will be there, uh, Marketing University will be there, and of course a lot of other uh, organizations will be there. So I will really take the opportunity here to um, bring this as an opportunity to really cherish our uh, collaboration. Um, I haven't touched uh, too much on, uh, on data and high tech, but uh, Eric will do that. Um, I would like to leave you with a message of cooperation. Um, it's not, it's a matter of working together between people and organization, our organization should and can facilitate that. But it's about people working together. So I would really urge you to take the liberty in all of your projects to really connect to each other and to uh, reach out and to connect and to see where there's bridges uh, to gap um, um, and to share the knowledge, share the visions and share your networks and to really start a new collaboration 
on my existing projects. So reach out and get to know each other. Um, and let's start by doing that today. Thank you, Preet. To Thank you. you, Ivo, in particular for emphasizing the need to collaborate to be able to spark transitions on multiple scales. Uh, well, with that, we would now like to move on to Eric Van Ingen from FAO. Over to you, Eric. The floor is yours. Thank you, Preet. And thank you, Ivo Demers, for your, for your introduction. Uh, yes, we, we do already work intensively together with Wageningen University. For instance, in your area, we work in the water productivity improvement project. And there, they also use heavily the data of um, the water plot platform. Today, we discuss science, technology, and innovation. And actually, the topic is also on uh, climate and science, technology, and innovation. And climate change threatens the food production. The, the two are very much interlinked. And the global food systems on their side account for more than 30% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. The world's food crisis and climate change are of an unprecedented scale. And we believe that conventional project approaches and methods do not suffer, suffer anymore. And that's where um, today also Ismahan Eliyafi, our FAO chief scientist, spoke about this science and innovation strategy. It is based on three pillars. Uh, the first is science and evidence-based decision-making. And the second is innovation and technology at country level. And the fourth is that where FAO can help and provide capacities to better serve the country. In FAO, as we was already mentioned today, we have a long-standing work relationship with Wageningen. And I would like to give a couple of examples where I was personally involved in. In 2019, we reached out to Wageningen for help on decisions on blockchain for climate action. FAO Wageningen assigned three researchers and at the side of FAO, we followed the work with 10 reviewers. From that, we published uh, together, the blockchain for climate action in agriculture. And in Wageningen, this work was led by uh, Len van Wassenaar. Her group uh, identified nine uh, uh, blockchain use cases from various agricultural sectors, and they were detailed and documented. Wageningen by then identified the three main features of a blockchain application, which was through a block distributed ledger there was a need for a governance and a surrounding ecosystem. And I come back to that later. With this publication, Wageningen really helped FAO in understanding that we should probably not start building with a blockchain. First, we needed to get the right ecosystem in order for consens consensus, governance, and the broader ecosystem. This work was of direct use in the SCALA program. SCALA stands for scaling up climate ambition and land use and agriculture through nationally determined contributions and nationally adaptation plans. This is a common project from FAO and UNDP. And here in this project, they work on um, solutions for land use and agriculture by identifying the climate actions through planning and the private, through private sector engagement. In general, you could say that Scala connects science and technology and innovation with the policy for the so-called national determined contributions. Also in this project, we engage with blockchain private sector players. This year, through the contract that we signed just in this last December, we kicked off two other streams, which were also blockchain related. One is on um, blockchain options for sustainable forest management. And the other one is on blockchain for child labor monitoring and remediation in the copper value chain in Ghana. We do this work with our colleagues in the forestry division and with our child labor experts from the agriculture prevention team. In this work, the common theme is understanding the key data elements that can be registered in the blockchain as critical tracking events for sustainable forest management and child labor risk exposure in the targeted cocoa growing areas. 
This is to improve child labor monitoring and remediation along the cocoa value chain in Ghana. Even though these two, these, these two streams are very different, we heard that on the bargaining side, they're actually, those two teams are actually working, speaking together also on a regular basis. And we were actually very happy to hear that, that it's not only us bringing those two streams together, but bargaining and proactively is uh, looking for synergies on both topics. Then another example, um, in another division of the division of nutrition, we, we came to speak about the notion of digital nutrition. And honestly, we are a bit in the dark here. So through our um, pretty extensive network with FAO, we, are, we also feel free to pull in some experts to have certain brainstorm sessions on what this does actually mean, the, the notion of digital nutrition. And if this goes forward, we may even issue a, a research with Wageningen University to better understand what is what is digital nutrition. Then, on a personal note, uh, I'm personally very interested in design science research, and this comes from a discipline of information systems. It ends, it tends to focus on prescriptive research rather than on descriptive research, and it has a strong focus on research through an iterative and agile design process. And somehow we all already applied this in the work of this year. We are designing how we can think the blockchain could work and could contribute to sustainability. I'm mentioning design science research only as an example of a new paradigm that could help us addressing the food and climate crisis because we need to speed up and in our um, dialogue and discussion with Wageningen I would really um, recommend that we would continuously review our paradigms and try to understand are we doing research in the right way are we doing science and innovation and technology in the right way and does this indeed lead, lead to uh, more effective policies so here I'm coming to my end of my introduction now. So being partners uh, as FAO, we are very open for feedback. And it's actually critical that we get feedback also from Wageningen. Because we in FAO, we, are, uh, we have competitors and it's good, competition is good. And we would like to improve our competitive uh, value as an international agency. And we would, and it happened already today, and where we would like to receive even more feedback from FAO, how could we can improve as an, um, as an international organization. Therefore, I would recommend that the partnership sharpens the collaboration with Wageningen and also with other academic institutes on a strategic level to advise FAO on how we can increase our value to the sustainable development goals through science, technology, and innovation. Over to you, Preet. Thank you, Eric, for providing those examples, in particular on the potential of blockchain for climate action, for child labor monitoring and remediation, as well as digital nutrition. Now, I see there are lots of questions coming in from the audience in the Q&A box and also in the, the chat function. Now, before we ask the panelists to answer a couple of questions, I would like to take this opportunity to invite the audience to reflect on a few questions and provide feedback as we move along in the chat box. After listening to the experts' experiences about the FAO Wageningen University joint activities, the results, the possibilities for scale up, how do you see the future of this cooperation? Are there other potential areas for collaboration? And also looking forward, if you could add in a few thoughts about how science, technology, and innovation can better support your region or your area of work. Now, I see there is a question for you, Evo. So this says, you mentioned shrimp aquaculture can assist coastal communities. What type of cultivation systems are you referring to as commercial shrimp farming in coastal ecosystems like mangroves is unsustainable and not eco-friendly? Over to you, Evo. Especially here, we have uh, examples. Thanks for the question. Um, you see, it's the same Risha also asked for the Caribbean um, uh, opportunities. Now here I refer to um, research we're doing in uh, Indonesia, where we combine seaweed with uh, shrimp farming in uh, mostly degraded uh, areas. 
where the ponds have not been used and now can be taken back into uh, use, providing uh, income and, um, uh, and also food from, uh, for local communities. Yeah, and about the, the mangroves, of course, um, a large commercial farming uh, is not what I'm referring to. Uh, the mangrove and shrimp combinations are in, uh, in Bangladesh. Um, where man applying mangroves on the sides of the ponds uh, provide um, litter uh, shade for uh, shrimp production. So that's uh, basically not the big commercial uh, shrimp farmer. I hope that answers the, the question, Marisha. Thank you, Ivo. Um, and Eric, uh, a question is posed to you. If you could elaborate a little bit on the importance, you talked about the examples of uh, climate action, of linking the food systems agenda with the climate, as well as the biodiversity agendas, and a bit more on the role of science, technology, and innovation therein. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, also, from my experience with the SCALA project, when it comes to national determined contribution, even with, uh, for myself, it was difficult to get my head around what, what is this project aiming to do. And now it's becoming much more clear, but it is indeed a challenge to um, connect all the dots. And especially for myself, when I, where I come from a technology background, I do notice that um, it is not an easy uh, construction. So we also, from the, the technology side, we really, we really need to explain very well and sit together in the same room with a lot of stakeholders. And of course, in the, in the technology side, I believe uh, we are very uh, comfortable with the topic of data and thinking in terms of data and where we can um, use the power of data or, or even see an ecosystem of data which can help on various levels, on, re on global level, regional level, and on national level. But this is somehow also sometimes a, a, a topic which where technologists like myself feel feel very comfortable with. But uh, not every policy makers would think in terms of data needs and how is able to formulate um, the needs or possibilities which are relevant for these specific areas. Over to you, Abrid. Thank you, Eric. And this is a really exciting topic, but we do face some time constraints. And uh, I would encourage the panelists to look at the questions that are directed to them and answer in the Q&A box if possible. So this has been, thank you to both Eric and Ivo for sharing your perspectives. And both in this technical session, as well as in the high level segment, we've heard that the strategic deployment of science, technology, and innovation can really be a central and significant enabling factor for agri-food system transformation. But this also needs a network of actors and an enabling environment and has to be accompanied by a range of social, political, and institutional measures for inclusive development. And strategic partnerships in this area are absolutely critical. In closing, I would encourage you to find more out about these topics by browsing the FAO and Wageningen University official websites. It was really my pleasure to be here today and moderate this discussion. I will now pass the floor to Ms. Inge Wallace, the moderator for the next session. Over to you, Inge, and thank you. Thank you very much, Preet. And what a lovely bridge you build right now, because you mentioned transformational partnerships, because this is what this session will be about. What, is, um, what do transformative partnerships mean for resilient agri-food agri systems? I'm joined by Ms. Marion Herens and Mr. Srill Verand. And like previous session, this session is aimed to um, make sure that you could all join. So please use the Q&A box, use the chat, which I've noticed you're all very, very good at. And I'm very pleased that you're all here. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in this world that you've joined us for this important session today and for this important whole um, session that we're hosting as FAO and we're together. This, record, this session will be recorded. Um, and so uh, uh, please uh, be aware of that. Let me first give the floor to um, Marion, 
uh, who carries over 25 years of experience in the food and nutrition and security health promotion, both nationally in the Netherlands as well as internationally. And she's passionate about action research and is currently responsible for work for the joint partnership with FAO in the DACA Food System Project. Marion, the floor is yours. Thank you, Inge. Uh, thank you all for joining our session on transformative partnerships for resilient agri-food systems. I'm pleased and honored to participate as a panelist in this session. Yet, at the same time, the title made me wonder what knowledge in action is needed to shift from partnerships building transformative capacity, as we try to do in the DACA Food Systems Project, to transformative partnerships, which in my view are a bit different again. So I start out with a kind of question for all of you. I was asked to make a contribution in my capacity as program manager for the support, the modeling of the DACA Food System, or in short, the DACA Food Systems Project uh, at the Wageningen site. The DACA Food Systems Project started in 2018 and will end next year in June 2023. It's funded by the Dutch Embassy in Bangladesh with FEO as lead implementer and Wageningen University and research as the so-called knowledge partner and co-implementer. But of course, we do all the work there in collaboration with a lot of national universities in Bangladesh, other knowledge partners there, and also societal actors in and around uh, Dhaka. A little bit about the background of the Dhaka Food Systems Project. Um, it seeks to have a positive impact and significant impact on improving the performance of the food systems for the Dhaka metropolitan area, which in a way is probably quite unique to make it really so specific in uh, spatial or aerial terms. In this project, we strive to build capacity for partnerships able to drive the necessary food system transformations to make this happen. The project area itself is quite uh, uh, well defined. It includes four cities, Dhaka North, Dhaka South, Gazipur and Naranganj, all together making up a population of over 21 million people. And uh, it shows a population growth of 4.2% annually. So it's really dealing with a whole large population groups in a very limited space, which makes the food system issues quite specific uh, indeed. It makes Dhaka one of the world's largest and fastest growing mega cities in the world, facing immense challenges when it comes to ensure food for everyone, thinking of its infrastructure, sometimes also poor infrastructure, volatility in food prices, food safety, markets and market management challenges, equity issues, nutrition issues, access and affordability of food, not to mention sustainability issues. But the bigger issue is that food is not part of an urban agenda. The food, four city corporations in the metropolitan area are unfamiliar with food in the policy domain, and it's not considered in urban plans. They lack knowledge and experience in food system management. Food is generally considered as an agricultural issue the domain of national government, primary, primarily the ministries of agriculture, of food, of fisheries and livestock. And overall, man, many government agencies are responsible for the food sy system, but they often also lack clear mandates when it comes to the urban level and coordination and collaboration are really challenging uh, uh, things to, 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 to undertake. Um, so our project seeks to contribute to this challenge of ensuring uh, that all people, current and future citizens in Dhaka have access to sufficient, uh, safe, healthy and nutritious food. At the global level, the pro project seeks to uh, assist the government of Bangladesh in meeting its international commitments under the Sustainable Development Goals uh, to, to end hunger and achieve food security and the Sustainable Development Goal 11 to make cities and human settlements more inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Some of the things we have heard before already by other uh, people presenting during this session. Um, so how, how do we try to make this contribution in our project? We adopted a two-fold strategy for strengthening the DACA food system. It's, it's trying to address many of today's urgent issues relating to food in the city, combined with developing the tools and strategies for developing the foresights and scenarios of Dhaka's future food system in, for example, 20 years from now, with a particular focus on 2041. 
how do we try to actually practice that? Well, we try to facilitate the change in, in, um, in, with a focus on the use of data to really build on evidence and be evidence informed to analyze drivers, trends and developments to map the DACA food system as it is and to identify key issues uh, which need to be urgently addressed or that have been largely ignored so far, for example, food loss and waste. And some of these uh, data uh, reg uh, regard markets, food value chain, food and nutrition security, food safety, but also socioeconomic data and spatial data. And we use either new data by data collection or we build on secondary data analysis there. There's also a focus on use of data for spatial and socioeconomic modeling and foresighting to be able to support the, and quantify the longer term uh, foresight and projections there. Um, think about land use, how that will evolve or the socioeconomic uh, developments. A third line of action practice in the project is by putting forward and testing workable solutions with city corporations and partners in the cities. And then you can think of very concrete and, and direct uh, uh, intervention strategies like urban gardening in poor communities or getting uh, farmers markets off the ground, start pilots on waste segregation, valorization of organic waste but through using uh, black soldier flies, for instance, use of biogas digesters, but very practically also with training on the ground in markets on food safety, training on the ground in restaurants, in slaughterhouses and so on. Very practical hands-on actions, basically done largely by the FAO team on the ground in Dhaka. And then there's the sharing of information and raising awareness as a kind of red threat throughout the project. So more people can learn and implement uh, the different practices within and across the city boundaries. Last but not least is the core focus of the project on strengthening food systems planning and governance. The project supports the formation uh, of city working groups at the level of the city corporations and to form uh, strong multi-stakeholder platforms to uh, be able to identify and act uh, upon the most urgent food issues, the pressing issues in the food system. Uh, hampering nutrition and food security for uh, large groups of, uh, of people. And also the national level, the project brings together a range of stakeholders to collaborate, including people from the private sectors, the civil society, uh, international NGOs, professional associations, the Bangladesh Food Safety Authority, for instance, and community groups. And our latest current highlight relates to the engagement of many actors across the different levels and disciplines in the formulation of the DACA Food Agenda 2041 as a strategy to establish and invest in transformative partnerships anchored in Bangladesh. We did this by implementing a robust stakeholder driven, but also evidence informed foresight process. And that's really driven by a joint FEO uh, work team effort, really working shoulder to shoulder to get that done. So it, makes, it made us actually really proud to, to have at least 70 to 80 people engaged in this whole process, thinking about DACA's food future. So let me wrap up with some brief reflections on what we learned uh, in the way we operated all of this. It was, our project was among the first uh, joint projects applying a food systems perspective while addressing urban food issues. And I, it might be still, uh, one of the very few projects doing that, acting at the subnational rather than at the national level. So in practice, it, this meant a lot of learning as we went along to find out good ways to align FEO and work planning, budgetary and operational procedures, which were not automatically uh, uh, fitting well uh, straightforward, in a straightforward way. And it, this is basically still an ongoing dialogue and it requires flexibility, adaptivity, while acknowledging and respecting also the differences at the same time. In my experience, the value of our partnership in the DACA Food Systems Project is firmly grounded in seeking complementarity in different approaches, uh, which opens up a great potential for joint learning, not only at our respective organizational levels, but involving all partners and stakeholders uh, with whom we work in this project. So this is what I would like to share with you. So I really thank you for your attention. And I go back to you, Inge. Thank you so much, Marion. 
Um, fascinating, I think, particularly for the audience to hear you talk about the, the element of subnational rather than national. I think many can probably relate to that. The fact of flexibility, adaptability, appreciating differences, um, and the shared learning. And I wonder whether you've concluded yourself, but maybe you can come back to that later, um, about the fact that building capacity for partnerships, whether it in fact means driving transformation. It'd be interesting to hear the audience um, and their reflections. But before we go, we would first love to hear from you, Cyril. You've been uh, with FEO for over 20 years, um, carrying great experience across the world in many different environments from Europe, Eastern Europe, to, Af to Asia, to the Middle East and Africa. So we would really like to hear from you. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Inu, and, and, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good morning or good evening, depending where you are located. And uh, thanks for the invitation uh, and to allow me to present one of the concrete application of the partnership between FAO and Vineland University uh, through a program called the Food and Nutrition Security Resilience Program. I will use the acronym for the rest of the, of the discussion. We call it FNS3 Pro. So what is FNS3 Pro? By FAO and Vineland Center for Development Innovation, which is part of Vineland University, and it is funded by the government of the Netherlands. It is a four years program that is addressing the cause effect relationship between conflict and food insecurity in Somaliland, in South Sudan and Sudan. So the program started operationally in October 2019 and is meant to end in September 2023. What is interesting here is to acknowledge that the FNS3 Pro program is a direct operationalization of the United Nations Security Council 2417. And for those who don't know what it is, I mean, at the time when Netherlands was in the UN Security Council in one of the rotating chair, the Netherlands played a key role in the unanimous adoption of the resolution uh, in May 2018, which establishes a direct link between armed conflict and conflict-induced famine conditions. And it strongly condemns starving of civilians and, uh, as uh, unlawfully denying humanitarian access as warfare tactics. So I think it was a quite strategic program and a quite strong decision by the UN Security Council in 2018. The program has been designed jointly by the government of the Netherlands, Vineland University, uh, NFAO. And basically, the program takes livelihood and resilient based approach in some of the least stable region uh, of Eastern Africa, as I said, uh, uh, Somaliland, uh, uh, South Sudan, and Sudan. Uh, the main premise of that agricultural program uh, is that um, livelihood, agricultural based livelihood, are people's best defense against hunger and malnutrition in general, and that people with resilient livelihood are better prepared and can better cope with shocks and crises. So that's basically the premise of the program. Well, at country level, what does that mean? It means that we have been selecting strategically uh, three value chain systems, and we are meant to strengthen these value chain systems. These are the Gum, Gum Arabic uh, value chain in Sudan, uh, the seed system in South Sudan and feed and fodder in Somaliland. At regional level and global level, the partnership between FAO and VUR focuses on strengthening evidence-based adaptive programming and implementation and building awareness and capacity on building food system resilience in context of productive crisis. So basically the partnership with VUR is focusing on the learning agenda and how learning is going to influence programming and behavior. And we are right now um, uh, plugging also behavior science into, into the learning agenda, which is quite, quite important for us. <clears throat> Why do we think that the uh, FNS3 Pro and the partnership with VUR is unique? Uh, first, because learning is part and parcel of the programming and the implementation. We are not doing a post-factum learning, but we are learning as we go. And I think it is quite important to to, to, to uh, acknowledge the change in the principle of learning, which often is post factum. So this time we want to do it as the program is being implemented. We want to be able to draw lessons as we implement. The other thing is really looking at who is learning. Very often we consider learning as important for those who implement and for the decision makers and policy makers. Here we start with the assumption that learning is also and 
primarily for beneficiaries themselves. And I think there is really an effort that is being made to make sure that learning is not just for us, but it's also for the people that we are trying to, to serve and to help through a strengthening a value food system. So FNS Repro is also flexible and, and adaptive. Um, as we are looking at uh, very regular so-called sense-making processes that enable the program to apply course corrector. And I think that's another very strong uh, innovation that we are doing in this kind of program. Um, and finally, Repro is evidence-based and informed by science. We are applying a very rigorous, rigorous methodology, including from the inception phase of, of Repro, where we had a lot of analysis and that, uh, that are reviewed on a regular basis. So we have baseline that are looking at, of course, resilience measurement, but also into conflict and, and conflict analysis and establishing baseline for the program uh, implementation. Let me give you some concrete example on, on how we have been using the learning agenda and the work of, uh, of VUR into the, the, the program adjustment. The learning agenda has informed the recent programmatic shift, for example, towards inclusion of a range of opportunities that do not exist necessarily at the beginning um, in the different value chain. Uh, we are looking in particular at private sector. When we designed the program, we looked at beneficiaries, we looked at the learning agenda and the academias, but we didn't include the, the private sector. We do realize through the learning agenda that if we talk about value chain, we must have uh, the private sector engaged. And we are gearing the rest of the program until the end of 2023 into a much stronger involvement of private sector. And private sector is not only the one in the countries of implementation. Private sector can also mean looking at, um, at uh, entrepreneurs and experienced people from the private sector in the Netherlands, for example. And how do we link the project areas with global entrepreneurship and innovation and knowledge from the private sector. So that's something that we are looking at and that we are learning and that the course corrector that or the flexibility that is provided by the donor will allow us to do. So I think that's an important, uh, an important element that we are looking, uh, looking into, into a more business oriented value chain system uh, in a win-win relationship between private sector and communities that are exposed to these shocks. Um, and when we talk about exposure to shocks, I mean, that brings me to, to, uh, to the second example. I mean, at the moment, uh, the Horn of Africa is unfortunately uh, facing a, a, a difficult time of different natures. When you look at South Sudan, South Sudan has been hit by, for the third consecutive year, uh, with floods. And of course, floods are potentially damaging all the crops, including the seed sector. So how do we adapt and how do we basically make sure that we have safe haven of areas that are less affected by floods that we could potentially transfer the program into or, or boost some of the areas that are not flood affected? So the adaptation is coming from the learning here as well. Likewise, in Sudan, I mean, the, the, the Sudan region has been unfortunately uh, uh, seen a, a significant increase in violence since the end of 2021. And again, we are looking at adaptation within the context of, of, of conflict in, in these areas. Uh, and in Somaliland, we are facing droughts. And again, I think that uh, it's, uh, it, it is, again, look exacerbating the need or demonstrating further, if need was, the need to adapt and to build this resilience system. So again, the learning agenda that we did at the very beginning is allowing us to apply cost corrector throughout, uh, throughout the project. And, and we are using our flexible and adaptive programming approach and informed by evidence and lessons learned generated through the learning agenda. Uh, and then we have identified action to maximize the FNS repro report and impact in light of the current and future shocks, basically. So I think that uh, these, are, these are some of the use of the learning agenda to adapt, not post factum, but within the implementation. And with, of course, this requires also a, a very flexible approach by the donor and by the government of the Netherlands in this particular context. So in conclusion, uh, let me say that FNS Repro is, in my opinion, in our opinion, is uniquely designed to support and work uh, with household communities, local organization and institutions, as well as government in building resilience in such a shock and stresses and to create the condition and structures necessary 
for a comprehensive approach to build food system resilience and for improving food and nutrition security in protracted crisis. The FAO VUR partnership uh, in FNS Free Pro allows us to set good examples, learn important lessons and identification of best practices of how to build food system resilience in protracted crisis. And then there is another part of uh, the program that is fundamental, which is how do we bring the learning agenda into the global network against food crisis, which is a global platform that both uh, FAO, the World Food Program, and the European Union have been at the origin of, but are now embedding a lot of lessons from a number of field programs uh, that we are implementing. And VUR is instrumental in bringing the learning agenda into the policy decision using a framework that does exist, that is the one of the global network against food crisis. So let me stop here, Ine. Thank you very much, Cyril. Um, you've emphasized the ongoing learning, the learning agenda um, at all levels and at all times, and making sure it's not just for those involved, but others. That, um, which is particularly important, I hear you say as well, in, in times of volatility. And I think we've heard that throughout um, today, the volatility at whatever different many levels is uh, fundamental to us. So thank you very much for your contribution. Um, and dear audience, uh, I've seen there's some questions um, and there's uh, input in the chat. I think I'm particularly interested to see if anyone has um, a focus on the, if we move to forward looking, being forward looking based, how can this, but also other transformative partnerships enrich your region um, or your area of work? So um, dear audience, if you could reflect on that, uh, I'd love to hear from you. And whilst um, you reflect and still listen at the same time, Marion, there's a question for you. Um, let me read that out to you. What would be your advice for building or strengthening partnerships for designing joint projects and activities that are really transformative and focused on supporting the transition towards the more resilient food system? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, in terms of strengthening partnerships, um, yeah, let me break it down because I think strengthening partnerships is quite an, an extensive action or can be is quite extensive action in itself. Partnerships are not just formed and stay then as they are. You know, they are dynamic, they change, people go, people go. So if you want to have strong partnerships, you should have people watching over the partnership itself. So it requires people who understand group dynamics, partnership logic, and also have a very good understanding of how to organize process management in, uh, in addition to project management. You need to be aware what processes require to, uh, to understand what people are doing in the process and how they how you jointly can move towards an output. So that is one thing. You need to actually have people helping your partnership to govern the partnership outcomes. Um, then the other part, um, I think you cannot say, we, we are actually driving transformation because transformations sometimes just emerge by the actions you take. It's not something like a project goal you can define from the start. You sometimes come across things which help and support or help drive your transformation. And then others you have planned are being stopped by certain events. So it is also being very um, keen. And then I go to more also academic uh, literature around food system governance for transformation. You need to be very uh, clear about how you frame your problem and with who. You need to be uh, very keen on, okay, where do I set boundaries for my food system? Or do we need to, be, to do a little bit of boundary spanning and who's able to do that? Who can reach out to partners we, we don't actually know? I think Cyril gave a nice example of how they now try to reach out to private sector which they didn't do in the first phase in the project. That's an example of trying to expand your boundaries. Then a the, then the third aspect is really to be adaptive and be flexible and not to be too rigid in what your own goals are, but really try to, 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 to be able to, to adjust, which I think also was shown in, in, the different, in both examples. Uh, and that can help build transformative capacity. Uh, Thank you. In a Thank you, Marion. And I see you nod, Cyril. And 
part of what um, Marion was answering reminds me of an element that you also brought forward, which is behavioral science. So I can imagine you would like to add something as well. So please go. You, you imagine well. Uh, now, look, I think I was about to say that. I said, if, if we want to transform food system, we have to transform people. And I think that uh, transform people in a sense, we need to transform our mindset. I think that uh, we will not transform food system if we consider that our systems are robust and solid. But we need, we need really to be able to, to change the way of thinking, the way of consuming, the way of interacting and understanding what are the bottlenecks for our food system or the limitations or what eventually climate risks or conflict are, are, are putting at stake when we talk about food systems. And, and we have big demonstration of that uh, nowadays in the past two, three years. So I think one element that, again, we were, we were not considering at the, at, at the beginning, but that came somehow through the learning agenda and a little bit opportunistically is the fact that uh, if we want to, to build resilience uh, against uh, climate and climate, uh, climate shocks uh, or conflict, then it's important we understand uh, indeed uh, what is the behavior of people and, and what is scoring high if we try to change the behavior of people or how to engage with people if we want mes our messages to go, to go well. As a FAO, in terms of be uh, be uh, changing behavior, uh, one of the big revolution in, 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 in the past 20, 30 years has been the, the use of the farmer field school, for example, which was, which was uh, very transformative in the way we are interacting with people, in the way we are transferring skills and knowledge. And I think this was very fundamental. We need to build on that and we need to understand again through behavior science, uh, how potentially we can influence systems. And in the face of, again, the numerous challenges that we are, that we are at stake. And, and again, I mean, just to mention here that uh, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, for example, are facing one of the worst droughts in, in 40 years. And we are extremely concerned by that. And, and obviously it, it it explained the relevance in particular in Somalia of the work we do on feed and fodder um, because, because the first livelihood affected by drought is going to be pastoral and agro-pastoral communities. So we need really to work along that line and, and behavior science would be important to it. Thanks. Thank you. And I feel like we're just going and I'm sure we would like to continue this dialogue, particularly also including the audience, but I'm afraid that time means that this session has come to an end. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Marion and Cyril, very much for your contribution and for reflecting on the points. Um, it was my great pleasure as communications director at WER to be able to moderate uh, this session. And I'd like now to um, say that this is the end. We go back to the wrap up of this um, FEO WER joint partnership uh, event. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Inge. And um, uh, this brings us, as you say, uh, to the last, uh, very last session of our very, uh, I think, very, very interesting, very, very stimulating event. And now we will do the wrap up. And I think, I hope that everybody is uh, as inspired as uh, I have been with these really down to earth, very important examples, including what uh, is more in people's minds uh, today than, for example, what is addressed by resolution 2417, uh, the relationship between uh, food security and peace. Uh, peace is, of course, uh, uh, fundamental to the whole of the uh, development agenda. There is no peace uh, without food security, no food security without peace. And the same applies to all of the SDGs. So very, very relevant topics uh, in this very important uh, collaboration that we've had up to now and that now we are reinforcing. So uh, it is my pleasure now to give uh, the floor back uh, to Luis, Professor Luis Fresco, who, as you all know, uh, is the VUR um, Executive uh, Board President. Luis, you have the floor for your uh, final remarks. Thank you, Martela. And thank you to all of you, not just those who spoke, but also the many, many people who commented um, in the chat. I have rarely been at a meeting where we had so much interaction. And I think that is a good sign. It's a sign that, first of all, this subject is really alive, but also it's an illustration of what science should be about. It is about dialogue. It is about talking together. So it's wonderful to see that put into practice. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to try and summarize everything, but 
I think there are perhaps uh, a few highlights. And I think one of the, the main questions posed in the chat is, of course, is this just another, I'm, and this is, these are my words and not yours, is this just another paper thing or is this really going to make a difference? And the answer obviously has to be yes, this is going to be uh, different. This is not just a paper thing because we all want this to work. But there are a couple of things that have been highlighted by the examples that may be pointing in the right direction. And I'm, I'm formulating them in my sentences, so I may not do justice to everybody. But it's very clear that by, by combining the strength of FAO being on the ground in a lot of countries and having the mandate also for standard setting and for policy uh, advice and the scientific expertise and educational expertise of, of bargaining, we suddenly have a huge framework of services, of ideas, of things that can be offered at the country level and the subnational level. So in itself, I see this uh, memorandum of agreement also as a mobilizing factor. It's, it can, it's not a pot of money, let's be very clear. There's not something hidden in my drawer here which can hand out cash to everybody who wants to collaborate. But the idea is to have this as a mobilizing force to draw in donors, to draw in countries, the private sector, and all those partners. So I think in that sense, we should highlight the strength and really target the kinds of people who want to be part of it. Because the second lesson of what you all said is you can only do this well when it's embedded in a whole national or subnational context. Uh, the context must be all the partners are, that are involved. The context must be also the, the public narrative around it. You cannot do this alone. It's not FAO and we're as a team going together somewhere and sort of out of the blue, come up with the miracle of collaboration. The collaboration is always with third parties or fourth parties or fifth parties. We know this very well through what we call in, in the Netherlands, the Dutch diamond involving government, local authorities, the public, the private sector. And this is true for every country. So it's, it's the mobilizing force, the building of partnerships, I think that are really the, um, the, the, the key factors here. Another one that we haven't mentioned, and I hope you will allow me to throw in one thing to the, to the conclusions, um, is we have a huge network of alumni at FAO, at, sorry, at FAO too, but I mean, I meant at Wageningen, and that is, um, we have about 50,000 alumni. A sizable number are in developing countries. A sizable number are still very much involved in these subjects. Let's try and mobilize them. When, when FEO and we want to do a project somewhere, let's look at who are the alumni? Can they be mobilized? Can their networks be mobilized? Third point is um, the framework does not mean doing everything all the time by everybody. It's not going to be one of these mortadella sausages that you know in Italy, where they're all little bits of pieces and they're all lumped together and then something big is coming out. Very savory, but that's not how this is going to work. It has to be selective, it has to be precise, it has to be flexible, and it has to involve, again, the right people. And the thing that was highlighted by several people, I think is very important, collaboration, whether it's with third parties or between FEO and bargaining, is very much about getting to know one another. It's about speaking the same language, spending time together as a team. And I really would like to encourage all of you to reach out, um, even here, if you've seen people who reacted in a nice way in the chat or, so, or, or post something that you didn't understand, reach out, write to them, and uh, find out how you can go together, how you can perhaps, you know, kind of, of develop um, a working relationship, even if you don't meet physically right now. So the, um, the last point I think which was interesting uh, from the chat also is um, how can we, um, again, my own words, how can we evaluate that we're doing the right thing? Can we be our own subject of research in a way? You know, there is very often we assume that collaboration is a good thing it's, as such, and it's, it's always taken for granted. But taking a critical look at ourselves, at how we collaborate, what's going well, what is going not so well, what is the next level collaboration that we want to achieve? Um, you know, we started in the 70s with what I would call FEO bargaining and 1.0. Well, by now we should at least have FEO bargaining and 2.0. 
And so being our own subject and questioning our own collaboration at all these different levels, I think is the, the, the best thing we can do. Last but not least, let's draw lessons from across countries, across disciplines, and across institutions. So let's not have things in isolation, but perhaps Marcella, think of creating a kind of little um, website or a group so that we can share interesting documents, interesting ideas, uh, all the things that are being said. I hope we'll, we'll keep the chat. So let's make this a living document and not a piece of paper. Let's really engage ourselves and, and do the best possible thing again because we're talking serious business and serious urgent business on top of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Louise, and points uh, very well taken. We'll make a point in ensuring that this becomes a real sharing of knowledge uh, opportunity. Thank you. And now um, it's my pleasure to give the floor to FAO's chief scientist, Ismahan Elwafi. Ismahan. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marcella. And let me first thank Professor Louise for her inspiring speech and, and, and the way really to bring point together. That's what we need. We need really to interconnect, be it ideas, be it people, like nature is. I always say it's many species cohabiting and linking up. So thank you very much to all keynote speakers, technical panelists, moderator, and the audience that really was very active in the queue and A and the chat. Thank you for the very productive discussion and for bringing your experiences, views and suggestions for the future of this partnership. That for us really, we see it as very important strategic partnership that is around science and innovation so that we get to a more resilient, more inclusive, more sustainable uh, uh, and more efficient agri-food systems. So let me also thank all of FAO and VER technical officers who have been engaged for so long in implementing this successful partnership through joint capacity development activities, joint projects and joint research program. And they joined Louise in really thinking big in if, if we are doing a new MOU and in one a day science and innovation is needed more than ever. We are really at very critical points where the only way for us to produce better and produce more with less, it's really to use science and innovation. So I hope really this critical moment in history and this partnership would really take advantage of this moment and this relationship that is strong and mature to develop more innovation. And I think really the examples we heard from the ground, be it from South Sudan or other countries, it's very interesting to keep in mind. And uh, let me also thank, um, a celebration, this is a really a celebration of the long standing partnership between FAO and FER to raising awareness of the new areas of collaboration established under the MOU that we signed last December. I hope really this is gonna be uh, bringing a bit of inspiration, but also interest because as Louise and the DG said at the beginning, it is a relationship between the two institutions, but definitely can get only merrier and better if we have other partners that can join us. We heard our technical expert experiences and lessons learned in different areas, including science, technology, and innovation for food security and climate action and transformative partnership for resilient agri-food system. Uh, I think really Louise answered most of the questions. And what I wanna only announced before closing is that we are organizing the Science and Innovation Days on the 5th to the 7th of October. And that's really a follow up to the Science Days that we did last year with the UN Food System Summit Scientific Committee. And we hope really in there we could discuss on a broader areas as well. Uh, but I, I think as it was said before, this is a moment where we have to do more and we have to do it differently. And I think in my mind, the combination of local knowledge with really the new technology could spark a lot of innovation and could give hope to youth to join the ranks and come back to agriculture because it's a, it's a very vital sector for the continuity of human being on planet Earth and in this life. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcella, for the great uh, moderation and over to you. Well, thanks to you, Ismahan, and I think uh, that um, just by seeing uh, the participants that are still here, more than 200, 
um, this shows that uh, this, uh, this renewed partnership is not going to be a paper thing, as Louise uh, said. I think we all know that it is going to uh, be a very, very valuable in all of us getting together and really moving forward toward, towards transformed agri-food systems. So thanks again. Thanks to all of you. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, listening to uh, all the technical presentations. I really feel extremely happy when I, I hear about working shoulder to sh shoulder between the two different institutions. Uh, just joining forces as if we are just one team, doesn't matter where we actually work in, but we are actually working together and that's what matters. So thanks again to ev each and every one of you. And uh, we count on all of you, all of you, your networks uh, to make this uh, partnership really, really reach out and have um, an important uh, impact. Thanks to all. And it's exactly 4.30 right now. So we're exactly on time. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And have a Thank great you. rest of the day, night if you're uh, in that part of the world, or even morning. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very, very much, especially Thank to you. the speakers also. And Marcella for chairing this so ably. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks to all. Thank you. Bye-bye.